maybe it would be useful to get like a, a definition for people who are, who have maybe heard like asylum seeker and seeking asylum bashed around. Like, what does that mean? And like, what are the the sort of international definitions of of how and why people can seek asylum? So basically, the idea of being able to seek asylum comes from a convention that was set up just after the Second World War, when basically Europe had a huge sense, it came from Europe, Europe had a huge sense of guilt about what had happened to the Jews during the Holocaust. And so in order to prevent that ever happening again, in order to prevent a situation where Jews were being turned away from countries because they weren't seen as being genuinely in need of protection and then they went off to the gas chambers, in order to stop that happening, they set up the 1951 Refugee Convention. And it's a very long document, but there's essentially one paragraph that matters. And that paragraph says, you are a refugee if you are outside your country of origin, you can't be protected in your country of origin, and you are in fear of your life or in some way in fearing harm because of a number of different reasons. It could be your race, your religion, your colour, your political opinion, or something called your social group, which is a quite vague term that's being disputed legally. Essentially, if you're outside of your country and you don't feel you can be safe, you have the right under international law, international human rights law, to apply for somebody else to protect you. And once you do that, once you go into a system, you become an asylum seeker. Now, lots of people can't apply for asylum because they don't have access to the systems. They would still probably call themselves refugees because they are being forced to move, but they're not in the system. So they're not an asylum seeker. You're an asylum seeker if you're seeking asylum. And that's a legal process. If you are granted asylum, then you kind of become a legal refugee in the sense that your rights have now been recognized and your need for protection has been recognized. But that's a very long process in many different contexts. And so, you know, this kind of asylum seeker is someone looking for protection. Refugees have got protection. But refugees are also those people who are kind of not in the system, in a sense, because nobody knows whether they need protection because they haven't had a chance to apply for it. Um, so it is, it is pretty complicated, but it is really critical to remember that it's a right under international human rights law. You have it. I have it. If someone persecutes me, and people have sought asylum from the UK or from Ireland, and they've gone to the US and sought protection, I can do it, you can do it, because that's a law that exists for all of us. It's just that we are very privileged, we're very lucky that we don't live in a, a situation that at this moment in time needs that. But if we'd lived in Europe and we were Jewish, you know, 50, 60 years ago, we might need to have that too. So you know, it's designed to protect anybody who needs it, in a situation where their countries can't protect them, or worse, so worse still, are actually persecuting them, which is, of course, also what happens. But the really important thing to remember, and this I don't think many people realize, is you cannot apply for asylum until you get to the country you want to seek protection from. So if you're a Somali and you want to claim asylum in France, you have to get to France. If you're a an Eritrean and you want to claim asylum in the UK, you have to get to the UK. You can't go to the British Embassy in you know, somewhere in Addis or in, you know, in a, a country where you've come from and say, I would like to claim asylum under international refugee law. You have to get there first. And that's the problem. Because in order to get there, you probably have to earn the service of a smuggler, um, break various different, you know, laws in terms of crossing borders illegally. And by the time, so by the time you get to the place where you're trying to claim asylum, you're an asylum seeker, but you've also effectively kind of irregularly or illegally entered the border because there's no other way of doing it. Hmm. That's a difficult problem. That sounds like a really difficult problem to solve because then you would but get in, in times of yeah. political will. Okay. Well, right. Okay. So how, so, so say, um, just like, for example, take the Syria or say, take Afghanistan for, for, for example. Yeah. And, and like there was, uh, when the, the, the crisis was happening there, when, when the US sort of pulled out with, yeah, yeah. let's not go there. But anyway, they, they left and yeah. left um, a mess in their wake. If, if you were able to apply for asylum by going to the embassy, would that not cause like an absolute swarming and swamping of embassies in times of crisis? 
Um, like, and, and again, this is not to say that I don't like believe that people don't have rights to try and 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 you know, because I would I would hope that I would have the same right, and I would, you know, want that to happen if I was in their position. Um, but like, how can you how can you like tr try to to reform that system without? Yeah, just swamping the assemb the the um, embassies of, of of different countries in in sort of more unstable places. Well, I mean, that's exactly what happened. Of course, you know, tens of thousands of people went to the airport in Kabul and tried to get out, um, mm -hmm. and many of them are still there, frankly. Um, but I mean, I mean, there's no there's no easy answer in terms of numbers. But first of all, most people don't leave unless they absolutely have to. I mean, I would you would you know, it's a kind of last mm -hmm. last hope, desperate situation. But the alternative, I suppose, it's very easy to say, well, that would be very difficult for people to handle. But the alternative is what we have, which is people then well, pay yeah. people to transport them illegally in the backs of lorries, dying in the Sahara. I mean, the stories you hear about this stuff, is not just in the Mediterranean or the Channel. The stuff that happens on land is often even, well, you can't really say better or worse. But, you know, I've heard some horrific stories about land travel, too, because people don't have any choices. So that's, you know, that's the alternative. It's not that... It's not that people going to embassies seeking asylum would be an easy or straightforward answer, but then neither is the alternative. The point is if the people if people need protection and there's a right under international law to get it, then it's the duty, I think, of the rest of us to come up with a strategy for how that happens, not to kind of blame refugees or asylum seekers for doing what they can to be able to access it, which is essentially what we're looking at. People are being punished, people are being vilified, for trying to access something to which they are legally entitled the bottom line because we refuse to set up any alternative system so i mean mm -hmm. i i don't think that you know the points you made are very reasonable but i don't think i like what we have currently i think i would prefer to try to find an alternative than just accept that this is the only deal because i don't think it's a deal mm -hmm. that works for anybody it doesn't work for refugees it doesn't work for governments and doesn't work for you know joe public who's frankly pissed off with the fact that they feel that these things are out of control so Surely it's better to come up with something that works better for everybody than keep on at the same thing that we know is never going to work because it's never going to work. There will always be conflicts. There will always be people moving. You know, what are we going to do about it? Just carry on as we are? It just seems to me crazy that we don't want to make things better for, for all of us, frankly. Mm. Excuse my language. But, you know, no, no, don't, don't worry. Trust me. <laughs> you, you've not got the worst. <laughs> yeah, you've not got the worst language of people who come on this show. Me included. Okay. Um, okay. The, well, it's but, a frustrating so situation. Essentially, I've been doing this research now for thirty years, and I I know what the solutions are. You know, they're not straightforward. They're not easy. But no one's even prepared to talk about them. They just want to say, let's you know, build more walls, put more CV, you know, CCV cameras in place. You know, put a net across the channel. I mean, these are just ridiculous ideas. A wave machine in the channel. These are the kinds of ideas that are being touted. But get nowhere even close to the crux of what's going on here. You know, they're very simple solutions because they're not solutions, they're a nonsense. But, you know, they're simple ideas that, you know, don't don't work. And then they're seen not to work. And then governments get attacked again and people get even more pissed off. And here we are. You know, you talk about the current crisis with the, the, the channel. I, I was working in the Home Office in 2001 when the song got crisis was happening then again we had the you know the crisis with the jungle this is not new it's just that people are not prepared to really grapple with the bottom line of what we need to do to solve it because they're politically you know i don't know what they are politically unambitious but also always thinking about the next vote and the bottom line is that this this is not going to get anybody any votes because it doesn't work full stop it doesn't work for anybody and i can't understand why people aren't prepared to take a slightly longer term view of this yeah. So you're essentially saying that the, uh, the, the, the ultimate solution is to stop all war and conflict. And that's not going to happen. Therefore, we have to deal with oh, the yeah. messy sort of fallout. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not going to okay. happen. Well, I mean, People are going to carry on moving. So what are you going to do about it? Are we going to just keep digging, big, building bigger walls and more prisons and, you know, spending more money on guards that are policing the beaches? I mean, you know, we look at what happened in the happened in the states. It's still happening in the states. You can build as big a wall as you like, but there's always a place where it can't be built because of mountains, or you know, it's very remote, or people climb over it. I mean, this is just, you know, it's it's not even an elastoplast on a problem, frankly. It's just spending money and wasting resources on something that can never solve the problem it's designed to address. Mm.
That's okay, so uh, let's. Yeah, yeah, I can understand why that would be frustrating. Having worked like worked in this uh, field as long as you have, like, I mean, I'm Absolutely. not not particularly. It's not it's not a field an area in which I've like spent a lot of time delving into the specifics of it. I mean, the I remember, and I still think that the the way we dealt with the the Syrian migrant crisis um, in 2012, 13, 14 was like the biggest moral stain on Europe um, the, in its history since like the conception of the European Union, essentially, like I think it was abhorrent well, the way we dealt with it. with the former Yugoslavia, to be honest. I mean, pretty bad well, with yeah. the Yugoslavia too. <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, I, I think that's right. And look, look now at what the Syrians are managing to achieve. You know, the Germans, as you mentioned earlier, they took the most Syrian refugees and now they've got the highest economic growth in Europe. Why? Because they allowed those refugees to work. They allowed those refugees to use the skills that they had. And the ones that came out at the beginning had a lot of skills. Um, and now they're doctors and they're working in the engineering sector and they're contributing usually to the economic growth and, and more than that to the society more generally. So, you know, you have to see you have to see human beings as being human beings, not just some sort of threat to your own security or your own status, because in fact, those people will contribute in many ways to what your society is, whether that's the economy or it's, you know, the food you eat or the music you listen to or whatever it might be. There is nothing that is uniquely English or British about any of this or anything that we do. So, you know, engaging with that history of migration that is what we are as a as a nation is one of the things that politicians could be talking more about. You know, they never talk about this stuff. They always want to talk about the negative and never about the positive aspect. And that means, understandably, that people think that refugees and migrants more generally are here just to take. And tell, let me tell you, I've never yet met a refugee, and believe me, I've worked with thousands in my career who wants to take. Everyone wants to work. Everyone wants to contribute. There are people who don't, as there are in every society, but it's a tiny, tiny minority. Most people just want to be safe, move up their lives, get their kids in school, make their dinner, you know, the stuff that you and I, as I say, take for granted. I don't, you know, the dehumanizing that goes on in the UK media about this is, is vile and it's toxic and uh, it spills over into all of us, frankly. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment for us in the comments below. Let me know what you thought and if you'd like to see more of this from the show. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time.